Hello, welcome to Mindful Matters Through Fiber Arts. Slow your breath, focus, and make. I'm Jean Bjork. Uh, this is my contact information. I teach at Pewaukee High School, and I became a fiber artist in a weird way. I'm actually more of a photographer, um, but through my photography work, I started exploring the possibilities of printing on fabric. And um, for my master thesis exhibit, I actually decided to make hand-sewn aprons that had uh, I had printed photographically on um, using cyanotype and Van Dyke Brown and even some digital processes. And that led me into this whole study of fiber arts. So uh, that's kind of where I'm coming from. You can reach me on the usual social media places. Um, I also have done a couple podcasts with Matt and Laura Grundler about mark making, which I consider fibers a way of making marks, um, and also a podcast on balance in your life. So. Here we go. Um, the QR code there, as you see, will take you to the web page I've created that goes specifically with this presentation. So uh, this recording will be there along with a lot of other resources and handouts uh, and a lot of embedded video links as well. So uh, most, almost all of the artwork in this presentation either belongs to me or to my students or alumni of Pewaukee High School. So we're going to talk about mindfulness today. We're also going to learn about fiber arts and what that means and what that is. We're going to look briefly at the idea of hosting a boot camp. Um, and then we'll have a chance to make some things with our fibers. Today we're going to focus on three areas of fiber arts, needle felting, stitching, or sometimes called embroidery, and shibori uh, stitching. We won't be dyeing today, but what you make uh, could be hand dyed if you choose to take those next steps. Uh, and then as I said, um, there are a lot of resources and handouts that I will again put that slide up at the end uh, and you'll have a chance to get to my website. Also, there are a couple videos that I'm going to kind of skip today because um, I want to make sure we have enough time for making, but in the PDF of this presentation, you'd be able to click on the links to those and watch them as well. Most of what's in the videos, I'm going to be live demonstrating to you um, once we finish this recorded part of the presentation. So what is mindfulness? I thought it would be important for us to start there. Um, I think that the word mindfulness has become part of this bigger wellness focus and it's sort of been branded and packaged and become this whole thing. Um, and, and I think, you know, it's become maybe, maybe we have different connotations of what we think mindfulness is. But essentially, it's the idea of being present in the moment and choosing to be conscious of our own body and its place in that moment. Um, so I think yoga is definitely an area I have been practicing yoga for a couple years um, and this summer I've actually been fortunate enough to be going to a weekly yoga class and it really has helped me to um, focus my mind, my breathing um, while I learn the stretches and, and expand my mind a little bit. Um, so that that concept of focusing is something that I think is very hard <laughs> currently in the world that we live in where we're always constantly connected. Um, even when we're trying to be mindful, we might have music on <laughs> in our ears, which is taking us somewhere else. So, um, so mindfulness is truly focusing on one thing and being in that moment um, with your mind and your body and slowing your breathing so that you can in fact be in that moment. So we're going to look real quickly, we're going to actually do what's called a guided meditation and this is a great way to get you to that right place um, and to help you focus. So if you would close your eyes please, take a deep breath through your mouth, exhale, And another deep breath, inhale. Exhale. Keep breathing slowly. Inhale. 
exhale. I want you to envision a place where you feel safe and comfortable and at peace. Maybe water is gently lapping or birds are quietly twittering in the background or maybe there's nothing. Breathe in. Breathe out. Focus on how your body feels in that place. Let your shoulders drop. Let your eyes be softly closed. Let your hands relax and be open. Breathe in. Breathe out. Breathe in. Breathe out. Open your eyes slowly and come back. So that was a chance to do a guided meditation. It's a very simple thing. We spent about a minute and a half on that. It's a really great way to calm yourself down, to slow your breathing, and to focus your mind. Um, through yoga, a lot of times what we're asked to do is to set an intention for the practice for that day. And so I'd like you during this time to set an intention for what you will learn and what you hope to get out of this um, workshop and to try to stay calm. Learning new things isn't always easy um, and be patient with yourself. Um, mindfulness is a great practice to teach our students for those reasons I just mentioned, being patient, <laughs> uh, learning new things, and, and being nice to ourselves, being kind to ourselves as we learn. Um, a lot of times kids come to us with a great deal of anxiety and stress, and so helping them learn how to cope with that stress is a great thing. There's been a lot of emphasis on SEL, um, social emotional learning this year, and the year before because of COVID, but I think it's something that we should continue to focus on all the time. Our kids come to us with a lot of different stories and a lot of different backgrounds. So um, another way that you can cope with stress and you can teach your students this, um, I actually had a student teach this to me. Uh, so she's she was recovering from PTSD and I was having a rough day one day and she saw that I was really stressed and, and I was so stressed that I couldn't even figure out what pile to take care of on my desk and what to do first. And she said, you know, Mrs. Bjork, I learned this. So um, what you wanna do is you just wanna start naming the stuff that's right in front of you on your desk. Uh, and then after you've named those things, then go on and name the next things. Um, and, and what happens is as you do that, stapler, flashlight, cell phone, notebook, as you do that, it causes you to focus on the objects and focus your breathing and slow down. Um, and it's a great technique, it really works. Um, so making, I think, is inherently very mindful. When we are truly in that zone of being a maker, we are really thinking um, solely about our art process and about what we're doing. At least that's what we should be. That's what we hope to be. Um, and so I want you to consider how your body is when you're in that maker zone, um, which we're about to enter right now. So, um, so fiber arts, we want to get our daily fiber for sure. Um, and, and no corny jokes aside, <laughs> um, I think that having a fibers practice and maybe attending to it daily or at least weekly is something that can really help you with relaxation uh, and stress relief and being mindful. Um, any materials that have natural fibers at the heart of their making are considered fiber arts. Um, the term textile art is sometimes also used and in, in my research I found a couple good articles, I've linked one here, that kind of talks about the difference between textile and fiber, um, but basically they're, they're pretty similar. Um, so fiber arts are things like stitching, felting, weaving, knitting, crochet, handmade paper making, anything that uses fibers mixed together to create a work of art. So um, when I teach my students about this, it's part of a bigger picture of I teach in a um, 
teaching for artistic behavior kind of a tab or choice classroom. Um, it's not a full choice classroom, but it is a, a um, choice classroom. And so what I like to do with my students is I like to allow them to um, make choices based on research and based on boot camps where they experience a lot of different things. And I think boot camps are a great way to give students a chance to play without um, worrying about a grade. It's a chance to act almost like a scientist and experiment and collect all of that visual data into a place like uh, we use what are called visual journals and we put all of our uh, experiences into those journals. And so it's a chance to teach the content um, and the media you want students to, to learn about. Um, and you can have a boot camp for a week, two weeks. And then once you've done that, then they take everything they learned and they decide, okay, I think I want to explore fiber arts a little more. I want to do encaustics. I want, you know, or maybe they come up with something that's very mixed media as well. Um, so I love boot camps. I, a great way to organize them is to kind of have handouts at each station and to use stations. I'll have two or three going on at the same time in my classroom and I'll split my kids up. And sometimes depending what we're learning, sometimes they'll rotate once during a class period, which I'm in an 85 minute block every other day I see my students. Um, and so sometimes rotating once during that 85 minute period works. Sometimes if what we're learning is kind of just shorter and easier, um, they might rotate three times to all three stations during the class period. Um, so there's a lot more on my website about boot camps and, and I've given you some templates for how to organize your own boot camps as well. Um, but it's important when we do boot camps, students have usually done visual research um, and they've watched some videos that show them how to do the different techniques. Um, while they're going to the boot camp, while they're going to that station, you're usually, as the teacher, I rotate around the room and I am checking in on them. And I'm also, if there's any dangerous materials like hot wax or sharp needles, I'm checking on to make sure that they understand the safety. And I've pre-taught all of that to them before they go to the stations. So these are some visual journal pages of students' explorations with fiber arts. Um, and the first thing we're gonna learn about is needle felting. And I love this video, so we'll watch this real quick. So hopefully you heard what she said. The one student um, said, so satisfying. And it seems like all of my students think fiber arts are really satisfying. So um, needle felting in particular is something that they love. Um, apparently poking a needle uh, over and over into uh, pieces of fiber and making them meld together is something that they really like and they think it's really satisfying. Um, so there are two types of needle felting. One is called dry, dry felting or needle felting. The other is called wet felting. And so dry felting uses the agitation of the needle poking into the fibers and melding them together. Whereas wet felting uses hot water and agitation and the heat pushes those fibers together. Um, so this is that one of those videos that you can watch later, but the idea is um, you know, that we're gonna learn about some needle felting and I'll show you how in, in just a few minutes when I go live. So um, things you need, you need a needle and these are different kind of needles than like a sewing needle. You, you have one in your kit, it's long and very sharp. Uh, you need roving, which are those fibers that you're going to use to make whatever it is you choose to make. You need some type of block or brush, and I'll show you, I actually have two examples when I go live. Um, and you need fabric, or you could also do freeform felting, which I'll show you uh, and talk a little bit about. So again, um, if you're loading this as a PDF, you can click on this link over here. This is my webpage that has lots more info and the video embedded on it. So, so the second fiber arts thing we're gonna look at today is embroidery or sometimes called stitching. Stitching, embroidery kind of used interchangeably. And that is that idea of sort of painting a picture but with threads. Uh, and so you can really tell a story by using those threads. And I, I think it's kind of cool. You can buy patterns and, that are already drawn and you're just sort of filling in stitching on those patterns. but. When I was a kid and I did embroidery, I don't do it as much anymore, but I used to do it a lot. I would, 
I would draw my own patterns. I'd draw my own pictures, um, line drawings, and then I would use those to embroider. Um, so I think it's kind of cool. Again, my website has a bunch more links about this for you. Um, and we'll be watching a video later during the live part to learn more about embroidery. Um, the stitches are like mark making. So when you're drawing, you might cross hatch, you might um, do X's, you might do a gradation, you might do dots, pointillism. Um, embroidery is very similar. It's a way of drawing with thread or painting with thread. Um, the thread is called floss and it can be made of wool, silk, or cotton, or there are also synthetic flosses now. So um, this is the video we'll watch live in just a little while when we do this part um, together. Um, but the idea is we're going to learn a few stitches that will be helpful to us um, for not only learning about embroidery, but also for shibori stitching, which we'll talk about in a moment. So you need an embroidery needle. That is the smaller needle that was in your kit. Um, you need the embroidery floss. And one of the things um, about embroidery floss is it's actually multi-stranded. So there are six stranded and 12 stranded floss. And so you're gonna wanna separate your floss, kind of pull it apart a little bit. I think um, for the needles we got, I kind of practiced with them ahead of time. Three strands, I was able to get through the eye of the needle. Anything thicker than three, it was hard to do. So if you wanna do full, fully leaded floss, meaning fully threaded, um, you might need a bigger needle, which wasn't in the kit, but um, you might have at home. So anyway, um, you want your fabric to be as flat as possible for um, a hoop is a great way to do that. And um, it's real simple. I'll show how to open the hoop later when we get into that. So um, the last kind of fiber we're going to talk about is the idea of stitching and dyeing fabric. Um, and this is called shibori. And shibori is a Japanese tie-dye technique. Um, and, and it comes from the word shiboru, which means to, um, I'm sorry, it means to um, bind, stitch and bind the fabric. And so the stitching and the binding of the fabric is what creates the patterns in the fabric when you do these dyes. Traditionally, shibori was um, done in indigo dyes, but um, you can use many other colors. Many kimono use shibori stitch patterns to create the designs that you see in the fabric. Um, and a lot of the stitch names are derived from nature. Um, over here you can see this, this is kind of an interesting piece that one of my AP art students made this last year. Um, she was a photography person, um, printed a lot of photos on fabric, then wanted to somehow put them together. So she decided to make um, a hand dyed shibori piece of cotton. And then she stitched and sewed these images in. This piece was all about her mom. Um, and so on the right, you can see this is one of my scarves that I've made. Um, it's a silk scarf, and this is just a small section of the shibori pattern. Shibori pattern. Um, these are a couple more of my scarves, and you can see you can get really beautiful patterning and really beautiful colors. Um, some of them are stitched, some of them are folded, some are bound. There's lots of different ways to get patterns with shibori. Um, so this is a video that you can watch later. Um, when we go live, um, I'll be demonstrating some techniques. I'll just be demonstrating one, but I definitely encourage you to go back and watch this video that I've embedded here. Um, the link to it is here. Uh, it's, it's a really great video on, on more about what shibori is and what um, some of the techniques are. So weird thing is in your kit, you probably found a long piece of dental floss. And that is what we're gonna do, use to do our shibori stitching. Um, I know that's weird, but when I learned how to do shibori, that is what the teacher taught us with. And the reason is, is that it's waxed and it's much easier because part of what you have to do um, is you have to, you do the stitching and then you pull the stitches tight to bind them for dyeing. And so, and then later you have to pull them back out when the fabric is sort of wet. And so it's much easier to do all of those manipulations with um, waxed thread. 
dental floss is also very strong and so it can withstand that binding and stretching that is going to happen. So you're wanting to um, iron your fabric flat and like I said you can do stitching on, on silk, cotton. The type of fabric though you need to be cognizant of because there are different kinds of dye. Uh, you can dye with Kool-Aid believe it or not um, but Kool-Aid only works on animal fibers. So you need to think about is my fiber animal based or is it plant based like cotton um, and and there are different dyes for that and I gave you a whole bunch of information about dyeing and sources of where you could buy dyes. Um, so and then once you know what you're doing it's kind of fun to do mashups of you know combining things. So this is a cyanotype that was printed on fabric that one of my students created and then went back in and did stitching around some of the areas of the cyanotype and then you know created this little frame. Another student did um, printmaking and paper making um, and so they made handmade paper and then they hand bound with stitches uh, and created their own book. So there's a lot of ways you can do these kind of fiber mashups. Um, this is some of my own art and um, this shows you the shibori process using indigo dye and um, it's really a fun process. I love doing stuff like this in the summer especially when you can hang things out to dry out outside. I also knit and needle felt. Um, I also do printmaking and drawing and painting um, and then I experiment a lot with photography as I said and photography is what led me to my exploration of fiber arts. So um, and there are some of the aprons I talked about. Um, so that's just a little bit of my own art practice so that you're familiar with the how and why of how I got here. I've lately been experimenting with uh, laser etching. Uh, and these are all images I laser etched into leather, into fabric, into wood. Uh, and I've kind of been at playing with that. Our school got a new innovation center and it's been a lot of fun uh, to play with that as part of my practice. So um, this is the resource page. And again, all of this is going to be also on my web page, which this QR code will take you there, um, including a PDF of this presentation and hopefully eventually a video, the actual recorded video of the presentation. OK, um, and then here's my contact info one more time. And there's that QR code again to take you to that web page. So this concludes the recorded part of this presentation. Now we're going to go live. Um, and start to make some stuff.